Let's go, Tyler. 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 Bridge the word, my brother. Come on, bro. Ecclesiastes, chapter one. Ooh, man, I love that book, bro. You better go ahead. On end. You know, Ecclesiastes, chapter one. Now, now most, most scholars, ICCM scholars would agree that- Absolutely. Uh, that all three books of the Bible, Song of Songs, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes were written by the son of King David, King Solomon, correct. who Very was correct. declared to be the wisest man to ever live. And we, we believe that he probably wrote Song of Songs as a young man. He probably wrote Proverbs as an older man and that he wrote Ecclesiastes more towards the end of his life. So let's glean a little bit of wisdom from here tonight as we want to become wise men and women in the campus and teen ministries. Ecclesiastes chapter one. Down let's go. Nine. The Bible says, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. You know, right here we find that in his wisdom, Solomon says, he says, listen, I've been around the block a little bit and I can tell you that what has happened before is gonna happen again and that nothing is new under the sun. That it's gonna be a cycle that repeats itself again and again and again. You know, for us today, we can really think about like our generation, be it your generation X, Y, or Z. Come on. Whatever you're a part of, we go, man, my generation is super unique. There's That's never right, been a group of people like That's right, bro. Us. Come on, bro. You don't know what I've been through. Like my struggles are super unique. No one's ever had to go through this. And the Bible says like, hey, bro, I love you. Hey, sis, I love you, but you're just in a rinse, wash, repeat. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Come on. Right, we can, Come on, Tyler. Understand. You're like COVID, right? In the midst of, of COVID-19, here in the U.S., we've seen over three and a half million cases of COVID, and yeah. over 43,000 people have died so far from this. Jeez. Wow. And you know what the reality is, is that just a century before, about a hundred years ago, back when I was probably in like second grade or whatever it was back in, in 1919, you had what was known as the Spanish flu epidemic, where over 50 million people died. 675,000 just in the US. See, our generations are not unique. We're the same again and again. We just come up with cool words. We call it great. We call it lit. We call it all this stuff, right? It's all super this. And, and that's awesome. But the title of the lesson tonight is to persuade you. I want to persuade you upon the oh, superiority bro. of the scriptures. It doesn't mean that we don't need to fight to be unique. It doesn't mean that something different won't happen, that there can't be a different outcome. But I want to persuade right. you that God's plan is the same. I want to persuade you that God's will is the same. And I want to persuade go. you that what we're going through has been done before. Therefore, we know the solution. The title of the lesson tonight is, honestly, nothing has changed. Honestly, come on, bro. Come on, bro. nothing has changed. <laughs> Look over in Acts chapter 17. We're gonna we're gonna sit here for a little while tonight. Well, let's go, bro. Come on, Tyler. Right. So so when we think of the 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 timeline of the scriptures, right? 1000 BC, shortly after that, Solomon, who we just read about, writes and pens down those books. So we're talking like a thousand years before acts is now being written down in the first century acts represents acts of the apostles it's a chronological Bravo. writing of what the very first church did god's people god's kingdom the body of christ the disciples the true christians what did they do after jesus said later 
and he ascends up into heaven and he says, you're the ones who are going to change the world. And so let's see, you know, we're about a thousand years later. By a thousand years, you'd think things would change. Honest. However, let's pick it up in verse 16. The Bible Come reads, on, bro. while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with them. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? You ever felt like that when you're on campus? You ever felt like, like you're trying to tell people the truth? You're trying to persuade them and they're just looking at you like you might as well be going babbling. Blah, 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 blah. And they're like, Come on, bro. Get you. Come on, Tyler. See, We've been there, bro. has changed. Boom. Let's keep it here. Others remarked he seemed to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting in the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Guys, Why? does that not sound familiar? They're just sitting around. Oh, doing no. nothing oh. but talking about and listening to the latest ideas this was Thin. first century social media they didn't need to swipe up left right or any of that they didn't need to, to heart it and like it and care it and all this stuff they were right there this was the modern day social media at that time see nothing has changed but if nothing has changed, then we know that God's will and standard remains the same throughout generations. No matter X, Y, Z, whatever you are, that God has a plan for you because he himself does not change. Come and so on, I bro. really want to look at three points tonight. And our first point is nothing has changed. Therefore, everyone needs to hear the truth. Come on, Tyler. Everyone. Oh needs to hear the truth. We find this man, Paul, an apostle, a messenger, one who is set apart to be so distinguished for God's ministry. He goes to Athens. Now, Athens is the epicenter of culture, of, 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 uh, of education, of philosophy, right, of all of these things. And his mindset was like, man, I'm going to take them on. He goes into the marketplace. He shares every day, day after day with those who happen to be there. Does that not sound like the sold out disciples of today? Come on, bro. That on. day after day in the San Francisco Bay, we oh always go after it. in the marketplace, in the campus, in the home, in our families, that we have a conviction on, that Everyone needs to hear the truth. Come on, Tyler. Come on. Yeah, come, come on. on. And believe it or not, like they found that this guy, Paul, was advocating something so profound. But what spurred him on? The Bible says he was distressed because he saw that the city was full of idols. You know, until we see the physical and spiritual condition of the places that God has sent us. We will never be motivated by an understanding of what God wants us to do. You know, when we walk on campus, we can start to become enamored by everything rather than inspired that God has sent us there. We go, wow. I mean, their life looks so good. They're going to get this great career and this great degree, and they're going to make so much money, and, and that guy's with that girl. And, and man, I, just, I want to be like this. And we start to let the world come on to us, and the world has more influence on us rather than us being the disciples, and we push back and put the world on its heels. Uh, come on, brother. You know, nothing has changed. 
Come on, Nothing bro. has changed. We're teaching something that is completely foreign to the world. The world says, get as much as you can. The word of God says, give it all up and you'll gain eternal life. The world says, think about me, myself, and I, and the Bible says, hey, be selfless, deny yourself, and watch what God can do through your life. The world portrays such a message, and yet what do we see? The world is so messed up. The world is so dark and twisted, and that's just the first world here in the United States. Well, Come I mean, on, bro. Really get started. The level of darkness that the rest of the world has, human trafficking and genocide, the hopelessness, all the garbage that we are honestly, in many ways, we're protected from here in the Bay. You know, the world says this, but it's the same today. What is our message? To become a true disciple a true disciple of Jesus Christ to give up everything, to watch that. Yeah, we can be like, man, what am I going to give up? But here's the reality. When you give up everything, when you submit truly as a disciple, when you surrender everything to God and you put yourself under his authority, here's the irony. That means he now has lordship. That means he's now the king of your life and he has dominion of your life. If, if someone yeah, come wanted on, to mess with your life after that, that hurts their dominion. That hurts their kingdom. No king Dang, wants on. to hurt their own kingdom. And so, in fact, when come we on, become come disciples, we've, we've really surrendered that lie. And we've seen so many people walk right up to the end of the diving board and they look out and they go, mm -mm, ain't for me. This is too much. And I'll tell you what, when you dive off that diving board for the first time, you're like, you know what the first thing you, you think when you hit the water? I want to do it again. Oh, There's honestly, bro. willingness to give up again and again because you know that God's got your back. You don't care if you see fins and the sharks swimming around in the water. You don't care what's going on because you know that God's got your back. And I think <laughs> every one of us. We are studying the Bible. We are on the precipice right now, jumping in the water. Let's and go. we're just teetering right there. And you know what? For disciples, we need to continually jump back into the water. We need to continually jump back into the surrender. Jump Contact. back into the surrender. Show everyone what a good time, how awesome and fired up it is to be a disciple. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Gave it all up. But look what you got in return. Too much. See, the world is the same. We think about what we're going to give up rather than seeing in the scriptures what we truly gain in Come our on, relationship bro. with God. Preach that, bro. You know, they're doing nothing but talking about the latest ideas. They were on Instagram and, and, and Twitter, right? Nothing has changed. And what's the, the sad reality of today? You know, everyone is interacting, but no one is connecting. Ooh. We got interactions like, yeah, I've got 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 friends. I got to create a second profile because that's how many friends I got. That's how many blah, blah, blahs I've got. That's how many likes I got. And yet we just see such a hurting and narcissistic culture. Now, no, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't have Facebook, right? Don't have Instagram. Don't have, you know, Twitter or whatever these things, right? But, but a lot of times what happens is that now becomes like the conduit to our connections. And so that then transfers into our relationship with God. We don't really connect with God. We're just kind of like around God. We're just interacting with God. We're just interacting with the kingdom. And now we're fighting even more. Well, we've got this great barrier of a screen that's in front of us. And we're trying to, to persuade people with our faces as we're wearing shorts, as we're in our flip-flops, as we're trying to do whatever it takes to go, nice, hey, you on the other screen. I've got to plead with you. I've got to beg with you. I've got to persuade you. Give it on up, even though you've never met me. I promise I exist. Talk about it, everybody. And I, I really believe 
that, you know, we've watched as a lot of people that have become disciples during this, this COVID era have also walked away. But I'll tell you what, every disciple who makes the decision to stay faithful during this time is going to become even more faithful, even more grateful, and even stronger because they're living out a Christianity that's literally not by sight. We don't even know. We can't even be with each other. And if you can be converted at a time where you can't be with each other, just you wait. Just you wait, my brothers and come sisters, until bro. you get to come back to a campus devotional in person. Uh, oh my goodness, it's going to be bad in a good way. You know what I'm saying? It's oh, going to be yeah. the celebration. Oh, yeah. All celebration. Oh, it's going to be Honestly, super bro. great. You know what I'm talking about, guys? And we've got to spur that message into everyone that's hurting right now. Everyone that's on the precipice of diving back into the world rather than diving into the scriptures or diving into the fellowship. You know, people are lost and they're lonely. And it's become such a dark thing, the, the devaluing of human life. You know, suicide in young adults has more than tripled since the 1950s. That since television and radio and computers and social media and all of this, since it's really taken over, it's more than tripled the number of people that they look at their life. They go, well, I was living the American dream. I, I had the girl, I had the guy, I had the car, I had the career. I knew what I wanted to be. I was so faithful. And then the world came and just smacked them in the mouth. And they made the decision, you know what? I can't do it anymore. And they take their lives. In fact, suicide itself has now become the second highest cause wow. of death. Wow. And that makes me sad, family. Because what these people wouldn't give, what these people wouldn't give for one more breath for one more chance and if they could have seen what prophets and kings longed to see if they could have just heard what they wanted if we would just understand that everyone could just hear the truth and have a chance just imagine what that would do how much that would cripple satan's design and plan to take as many lives as he possibly can they say that 80% of college students today feel completely overwhelmed. In fact, 45%, almost half of college students feel hopeless. Not just overwhelmed, but hopeless. And yet we live in a, in a culture and society today where you take your phone and you're, hey, and we try to put our best face forward, try to we do all the duck lips. We do all these things. Whoa, whoa, right? Instead of just being real. Come on, bro. Where we're really at. You know, family, we're not exempt from this. If you're in a dark place, I got to challenge you and plead with you to get open. If you're visiting with us and you're in a dark place, we want to get you out of it as soon as yeah, come possible. On. Come on, bro. Yeah. Come on. Yep. You look over, look over in John chapter eight. In John chapter eight, let's go. Bro. We're talking about everyone needs to hear the truth. John chapter eight it, it is quite fascinating because down in, in verse 31, this is Jesus talking about the truth. And he says to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. We see it on libraries. We see it on buildings. The truth will set you free. But if people don't hear the truth, how can they be set free? And I believe that for all of us, we've got to understand, it's not just knowing the truth, but we, in fact, we've got to hold to the truth. It's got to become our very sinews, 
our very marrow, our very joints, our very molecules that we hold to God's teachings. Come on, Tyler. And the truth will set you free. Well, here's the challenge. Nowadays, if somebody told you this type of pattern of thinking, you know what we would call them? A scam artist. Because Jesus is saying this, hey, listen, hey, listen, uh, dude, listen, gal, how much money you got? Oh, I, I got a few Bitcoin, I got a few of this. Okay, so you got like, you got 10,000. All right, here's what I want. Give me your $10,000, come back to this same exact spot tomorrow and I'll have a million dollars for you. Come on, Tyler. What are you talking about? No, no, no. Like, look, can you show me the proof? Can you show me the statistics? How, what, what's your reviews? How many stars do you have? Can I find you on Yelp? Do you have a, you know, like we want to no, 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 no. And when we want to no, 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 we don't realize we're saying no, 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 no. I don't want to follow you. I want to follow my intuitions. I want to follow my feelings. I want to follow what the world is doing. And yet God is saying, you've got to trust me. You won't know the truth until you hold to it. But we're thinking, man, I, if I'm going to invest, I want to make sure. And God's like, no, hold to me now. Well, Jesus, are you the truth? How can I know? How can I do this? And he goes, you won't know until you do it. Come on, bro. Hey, hey, Tyler. Come on. You see, everyone needs to hear the truth. And the truth will set them free as we challenge them unapologetically to hold to this. And, and guys, all of us that have held the truth, can, can we be honest? The truth has set us free. Super free. Come on. Yeah. We've True. been unleashed. That's... We flat been on, unleashed, bro. family. They talk about the Christianity is like all ball and chain and what you do not do and what you cannot do. Yeah, right. We've had so much fun as disciples. Yeah. Some I'm disciples, bro. they were going yeah. skydiving the other month. The most fun. Yeah. I was there. I was there. I was there. Yeah, I was there. It was I've seen it more was of the late. world as a disciple than I would have ever done in my pathetic life. I'd be stuck in, in over in Cranwell, Oregon, doing Lord knows what rather than living out the greatest purpose that any human being could ever have. Come on, bro. Everyone needs to hear the truth. Let's go. Look over back in Acts 17. Acts 17, in Come verse on. 18, right? It says a, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with them. Well, who are these people? You see, the Epicureans came from a philosopher named Epicurus, right? And Epicurus created this philosophy that pleasure is the highest form of good. Do whatever makes you feel good and avoid pain. Does that not sound like today? The world's Come on, like, bro. Great. Hey, do, do what makes you do you. Does that make you happy? Does that make you feel good? Does that make you like feel better? Then do it. That's the best plan you can do with your life. Like, wow. You would think that we would learn the pattern of all of this, that a thousand years later, you'd be like, you know those guys back there, the Epicurean dudes? No, but here's what Satan's scheme is. Satan just takes it. He puts another label on it. He puts a different little set of ingredients. He puts it on the shelf and we're like, Oh, this is cool. I want this. This is the same thing today. We live in an Epicurean society. Just do what makes you happy. And Preach, now we live bro. in a society where you cannot just do what makes you happy. You got to accept what everybody else thinks makes them happy. And you know what it's produced? Ooh. It's produced a nation that's completely unhappy. This is the most divided on, time we've probably ever had in the nation, in the history of our nation. It's more divided than ever. And what do each one of them equally believe on their own perspectives? I should be able to do what makes me happy. And the other side goes, no, 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 I don't like that. I should be able to do what makes me happy. And then we go like this, we put a line, we draw boundaries, and that's exactly what's happened today. You see, God wants to take that away. What are the Stoic philosophers? Stoic philosophy was simply like, like Stoic is being just like this. You don't, it's like a statue to be super Stoic. 
<laughs> and so the premise is, is to say, avoid anything that causes pain in your life. Avoid all extremes. Don't have any convictions. Whew. That's exactly what we see today. So now we see that these people were being told these main, and then they're being told, don't do whatever makes you happy and don't do what just ever avoid. You've got to learn that there is a God who sent his son who died for you and he came back, he gave up his life. He had an entire life of pain, of turmoil, but he saw you as worth it. And some said, this guy's blah, 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 blah. He's a babbling. And others go, huh, tell me more about this God. Isn't it Come awesome on. when people tell you, tell me, off, yeah. me more? Yeah. You know, we are in a tell me more movement. God wants us to tell more than ever before. We started in a ragtag group of 42 down in Southern California in Los Angeles. And God put that dream and vision of the scriptures to be a church of totally committed, sold out disciples who will go anywhere, who will do anything, who will give up everything with the vision of discipleship in their lives to be there sharpening each other so that we, in fact, when we go like this and we go, uh, and little X's go over our eyes. We laid our eyes to rest. And we evangelized the entire world that everybody heard the truth. Come, Come on, Tyler. Come on, Tyler. 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 Those 42 are now over 100 true churches of disciples in over 50 nations around the world. We're over eight thousand strong with the mindset that goes, man, we're going to get to over 10,000 for the Lord. We're going to throw that mountain in the sea. And Lord willing, we're going to send out 15 more churches in the what? next oh, two oh, years. Oh, oh, we're changing the bay. The bay is radically different. They think it's the yay area and all this culture. The true culture is going to come from the kingdom of God. Come on, bro. Area. Over 280 yeah. disciples. Started yeah. with just 20 disciples. Now we've got seven full regions with two more to be sent out. The church has sent out literally hundreds of leaders, seven full-time couples to go out there. Why? Why would we do this? Why would we give up our best? Why would we put ourselves through this? Why would we do that? Simply put, because we understand Everyone needs to hear the truth. Let's go back to Acts 17. Verse 22. Verse 22. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I can see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you're ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. We stop here. You know, remember, these are the, the Athenians, right? So, so what did they worship? The, the Greek gods and goddesses, right? Zeus and not Thanos, amen, but Hermes oh, amen. And, and all these things. That's what they worshiped. And, and, and so Paul, he walked in, he goes, man, these guys are worshiping like all of these statues. And, and so his response, he goes, hey, I can see that in every way you're very religious. Is, is that what we consider a religious person today? Like we're really going after, the, it's really hard to convert those religious Zeus people. I mean, we're doing really good. And, and then all of a sudden we, we, we met <laughs> oh those guys from, from the Hermes temple and man, they were just they're really hard to get to. We, we, we don't see these people as religious. But what is Paul trying to emphasize? Our second point, everyone is religious. Everyone is religious. It's a good point. You know, nowadays, we, we just assume that a religious person is, is someone who goes to a church all the time and listens to Christian music and, and they put their hands up and, and they've got their bracelet that says, I love Jesus more than I love myself right? And they got the hat and the shirt or whatever, and, you know, and, the, and they carry their Bible with them and they're out there feeding the homeless. You go, man, this is like a super religious person. And what's, what's, what's the reality? 
whatever you're devoted to is your religion. Whatever you commit yourself and worship, whatever you adore and prioritize, that is your religion. Some people's religion is school. They, They lay their life at the altar of education. They bleed for it. They sacrifice for it. Some, it's, it's their family. Their family is their religion. Their family is what they bow down to. Their family is what they surrender to. Their family is what they're indoctrinated the most by. Some, it's money, man. Money, money. They just want to be where the money resides. And they worship it. They do whatever it takes. They think about it. They just, they just, they want oh my it more gosh, than bro. anything else. It's just what they desire. It's what they wake up longing for. It's what they put first in life. It can be their career. It can be their relationship. In fact, it can be themselves. Ow. Whatever you worship, whatever you prioritize. You see, everyone's religious about something. Nowadays, it's no different. See, back then they worshiped Greeks, Greek gods and goddesses. They worshiped trees. They worshiped animals. They sacrificed their children in fire to make their gods happy. Literally, there was one religion. There was how they worshiped the sun god, and they believed that the sun god brought fertility. So the temple priest, they would go and they would sleep with virgins that were brought to them. The virgins then would become pregnant and give birth to these babies. Talk about and these it, bro. Babies at three months old would be sacrificed. Their blood oh my spilled gosh, into a the- bowl. They would take eggs they would dip the eggs into the blood believing what? that through that sacrifice that the god they worship would give them a fertile family a oh, no. fertile future and a oh, no, fertile child. life oh no god, what? guys and nothing Elizabeth. has changed nothing's changed how many people be it literally have sacrificed their children have Come given on. up their children to abortion to kill them in this manner because they thought their life was more important and they were hoping that that by doing that they would still be able to have their future and their life. How many children, although alive, are completely thrown to the wayside, completely thrown and deserted and left as refuse, left as garbage because their parents or whoever is in their life thinks that their life is more important because of what they worship and they sacrifice that child for themselves. Come on, bro. How many politicians are worshiped today? Celebrities, athletes. I just want to be like them. I just, I just, man, you know, if I could just have like a 34 karat diamond right here in my head. I'd feel oh so my cool. god! If I could oh just, no, oh, no, Uzi. just do all of these, oh, things, no, it would be so cool. If I come up with something, then people are gonna like me. And here's what's crazy, guys: What do you call people that are going and they're liking and they're subscribing to all of these people? We call them what? Followers. Come on. Followers, bro. What do you call? Got him. That's a disciple, a student, a learner, a follower of Jesus Christ. Wow. Nothing has changed. You know, I think we got to ask ourselves tonight, what is your religion? What is your religion? If people followed you around for a week, what would they say your religion is? Dang. If they just got to take little little notes, little little social experiment right there and go, what 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 does Tyler do when he wakes up? Oh wow. What does he say versus what he does? What does he claim versus who he is? You know, for us, we've gotta we've gotta understand something right here because nowadays the religious person isn't convinced by their religiosity. See, they've let go of the standard of the Bible. And let's check it out over in John chapter four, just how different things really are. Come on, Tyler. Come on, Tyler. John chapter four. Let's go, You know, it's fun when you're, when you're uh, the host for the Zoom meeting, so you can just kind of go as long as you want. Everybody can leave, but I'll just still be here. Go ahead and preach, bro. 
That's how you do it. Go ahead. Don't let that, don't let that watch go ahead bother and you, preach, bro. bro. Don't let the watch bother you. I heard I heard a, a uh, wise prophet once say, I'm gonna take my watch oh, off oh. so I don't keep track of time. Maybe you should do the same. Oh, come on, bro. Wow. John 4, no. verse 23. The Bible says, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and and in truth. You know, one of the things that the religious world totally has on straight is to worship in spirit. They've got it on lockdown, man. They are super sincere. I've never met an insincere religious person. They're like, yeah, I don't really want to do this. I just kind of do it because I have to. You know, they're super sincere. So what is the dilemma today? The dilemma today is not that they're not sincere, but they don't worship in truth. And you can be sincere and still be sincerely wrong. There it is. That's a tough uh-huh. one. Hey. You know, uh, this Sunday is, is Super Bowl Sunday. Every year I get super salty because oh. just a few uh, just a few years ago. My, my, my team, open, the team, the only oh, team, I remember. the oh, yeah. Seattle Seahawks, In there. they were going after something that has rarely been done before. They were going for a back-to-back Oof. Super Bowl victory. Yep. And, and things were grim, but, but, I, but I, I sincerely believed I was the only one. And, uh, you know, Russell Wilson, the quarterback, he just kind of throws like a just – throws it up there and I'm watching it. I'm like, Oh, it's over. It's third down. It's just, oh, I can't believe this, but don't lose hope Tyler. And the ball like goes bink, 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 bink. It pinballed off of like the defender and the wide receiver, the person he's throwing it to. And at the last second, the wide receiver like miraculously catches it right there. And then on the ensuing place, they get all the way to the one yard line. They literally just had to hut you sneaks and they score the touchdown and they're going to win the Super Bowl. The next play, I, I'm like pretty sure they went in. I'm like convinced. I'm like, dude, they went in too. And instead on the next play, they throw the ball. This guy jumps the route, right? He jumps in front of the, def- the defense catches the ball rather than the offense. I'm trying to help the sisters out so they don't, they don't lose focus here. And the guy catches it, the defense, so therefore they don't score, they don't win the game, and my heart has been broken ever since. You see, I sincerely knew for a fact. I watched it with my own eyes. I was there. I experienced it. But when you show the replay, and it shows that the ball didn't cross where it needed to to score that touchdown, you know what I still say? I I, I don't care. I know it went in. And this is what we face today. We don't face people who don't want to go after truth. See, the issue is, is the Bible's very clear. The Bible's super clear. But people don't want to accept the truth because they sincerely worship something else. They sincerely want their family to be saved. They sincerely love the approval of men. They something, and that is perhaps some of us tonight. We're so scared of accepting the truth because we know that it's going to produce a different spirit to our life, different than what we grew up with, different than our church that we went to, different. And here's the reality. The reality is like nothing actually changes in your life in the sense that like, like, you, you can't be friends with religious people. You can't, you know, one day pray that your church will change. And the reality, these people weren't even there for you in the first place. They weren't even there. They don't know that yeah. sin that you got open with the L&D during light and darkness, the cross study. They didn't know what, what you did oh, to on, your family. And, and the sin that you, what you stole and the things you looked at on the internet and the things you said behind their back. 
and the hopelessness, the time where you tried to take your own life and you told nobody and you were all alone, but they're like your, your best religious friends have always been there and you guys went to every single summer camp. Why? That's not on them. They don't know how to do that either. They've never been taught how to do that either. They're dealing with their own stuff. Everybody's closing their doors. But you see, for us today, we've got to realize that everyone is religious. Come on, Tyler. And we've got to fight to get them out of this, to get them out of a religiosity. God is not looking for the religious. He's looking for the righteous. And to be righteous is to not be perfect. Righteousness is defined by our response when we fall short be it in our righteousness of our life or when we fall short in the righteousness of our doctrine of our truth. Come on, bro. Look over quickly in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Let's go, Tyler. Come on, Tyler. Come on, Tyler. I just want you guys to know nothing's changed. This is not like, you know, whoa, I've never, a lot of us, we just didn't realize it was like this. We were shook, man. When we saw the scriptures and we like literally, like we finally saw the scriptures and the scales like fall out of our eyes and we're like, there's that moment because we're kind of tough on the exterior. We're like, yeah, whatever. Mm, you know, I heard that before. Yeah, oh, yeah, I don't know. And then you like finally take it and you're like, no way, right? And you totally submit to it and you get baptized and now you're in the kingdom and isn't it awesome when you got that baby christian that's blown away by that scripture that you've read like 50 times and they're like oh dude bro i gotta share this yeah yeah go ahead which bro i read this have you ever read matthew 28 you're like yeah but uh, what are you talking bro this is crazy like jesus literally says make disciples of like all nations bro have you ever looked at a world map that's what Jesus wants. And you're like, guys, I've never seen this before. This, I mean, and we got to baptize them. Did you know that? And never then knew, teach, him, teach him to obey. Dude, what? But here's the thing I bet you never knew. I know you've read this. You probably, Jesus says he's going to be with us always. No kidding. New and that's like, that's the sincere heart we need to have when we read the scriptures. This like, I've never seen it before and I'm so grateful. Can I have another one mentality? Why? Because this keeps us from becoming religious. We, we, we think like we've got like an exemption. We've got some like card here. Got my exempt card. I'm not religious. I got my exempt card. You know, I go to devotionals. So therefore I'm righteous. Got my exempt card. I had a D time last week. I'm righteous. Got my exempt card. I gave missions last year. Most of it. I'm exempt. That's not how this works. Most of God it is not looking for a religious Most of it. The Bible says, seek first, yes, his kingdom and his righteousness. God cares more about his righteousness than he does his kingdom. And if we stop being a righteous people, he'll wipe us out. He'll break his kingdom down and he'll literally take the kingdom and he'll give it to somebody else. Oh, come on. Second Timothy chapter four. You guys find that one yet? Yeah. Verse one. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge, preach the word, be prepared in season, out of season, correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Why? Verse three, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Nothing's changed, guys. This is like a few decades into Christianity when this is written. And what was the issue? Already people were like, nah, nah, nah. I know what it's going to be like. I, I've got a better idea of Christianity. I know how it, and they go, well, you know, I know you say that, but listen, I got all of these people. I mean, we're talking a lot of people. How many people go to your church? How many people you got to agree with you? Because I got more that agree with me than agree with you. So fair, I must be right. And this is literally one of the byproducts of what's known as the democratia, 
right? The democracy of the world, that if you had a committee and enough people on that committee agreed with it, it became the new truth. And what do we live in today? A society, yes, of democracy. Thank God we have democracy. But it's, it's now abused and into the realm of religion, of Christianity, of the scriptures, where if enough people say it, it must be true. That's not how it is. We turn aside from the truth. And now we believe in stuff that's like not even in the Bible. It's crazy. The things that people believe. They believe that there is a woman in Korea who is the reincarnation of God. She is Mother God. And millions of people believe this. It's wild. They, they took the Bible standard of being a true disciple and they watered it down with what we know as cheap grace that all you got to do is believe and here's the irony see grace is an undeserved gift therefore grace means that there's nothing you can do and if we're saved by just grace then we literally we might as well just cut off our arms and our legs and live no life doing anything because it doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you think or feel. That God is just going to save you anyways. So it doesn't matter if you're immoral. It doesn't matter if you're impure. It doesn't matter if you're disrespectful, if you're dishonest, if you're a liar, if you're a thief, if you're prideful. Because God's grace, you're just saved by God's grace. And you don't know when it's gonna come or how it's gonna come, Dang. but it's gonna be there. On, because Tyler. grace alone saves you. This doesn't wow, work. Wow. Come on, Tyler. Come on, bro. This doesn't work. We we follow a tradition where we go, hey man, you know, babies are born with sin, and and uh, you know, the guy who leads all of this, he's sinless. We call him the Pope. Uh, you know, we believe that that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross, and we are to be Jehovah's Witnesses. Hey, we believe that this other guy, this random white guy in the middle of America who was killed in jail because he's arrested for polygamy and all these crimes that he committed. He had a special angel came down with gold tablets and he told us the true revelation. In fact, even though the Bible says, even if an angel comes and tells you, let them be eternally condemned, we go, no, 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 my friend. He must be telling the truth. And we believe still all nations, but not black people. Black people cannot be a part of our church. Okay, they can be a part of our church, but they can't be leaders. Come on, Tyler. This is crazy. Come on, bro. This okay. is crazy. And then you got the other side of the world that believes like God is like a like a 40 armed elephant. Oh and my a god. With milk and a globe on top of it. Others believe that like they their 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 king or their queen is literally the reincarnate of God. It's crazy. And people like they bow down and they accept this so easily. Why? Why is this happening? Why? Because everyone is religious. Mm. Nothing has changed. You know, I want to challenge us simply quit being religious and let's be righteous as we live out. Come on, bro. One last point. You with me here, guys? With you, bro. Tyler. With you, bro. Come on. Come on, Tyler. If everyone needs to hear the truth, which we believe. And now we're persuaded that everyone is religious, then here's the, the, the irony of it all. Our third point, everyone is actually seeking God. Come on, bro. Wow, okay. Look back in really Acts, Acts chapter 17. I'm gonna see how quick I can get through this because I got a cool little nuggy nug here for you. Come, Come on, bro. bro, please, bro, please. I got ketchup. Let's pick it up where we left off in verse 24. The Bible says, this is, this is, remember, this is Paul talking to the Areopagus, the campus ministry. He's tweeting about this right now. It says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him, we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his 
offspring. We stop here. He's quoting their own philosophy. He's trying to turn their own religious ideas on top of themselves and says, listen, you guys are so religious. You literally like covered all of your grounds. You got the God for this, the God is for that, the God for this, the God is for that. And even then you're like, oh, wait, wait, wait. We don't want to offend if there's an unknown God. Get the statue and, and little plaques to an unknown God. He goes, aha, let me tell you about this unknown God. And he says, God, God set it all up. God's not in temples and hands and this and built by people. And that's not what it is. He's the one that gave life and breath to everything. It wasn't that it's in the opposite. We think that we give life and breath to our gods today, that we, with our life and our breath, we make our gods and then we worship them. But it's the opposite. God made us. He gave us life and breath. And then the Bible says he determined the times and places. Why, why did God do this? Here's what's so fascinating. You know, a lot of people, they believe in, 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 in the idea of predestination, that everything in your life has been preordained by God. Therefore, it doesn't matter because God has already made it there. In fact, you've already been born to go to heaven or born to go to hell, and it's been destined by God. God is interacting and intervening in every single particle and partition and place of your life. That's predestination. Then you got the others go, no, that's not what it is. I can do whatever I want. YOLO, right? And so then what happens? They believe in this idea of free will, that I can do whatever I want. And God can't say nothing or do nothing. But what does the Bible teach? The Bible teaches right here, both. What? Does not compute, right? The Bible says God sets up the times and places. You didn't choose your parents. You didn't choose where you're born or when. Sometimes I go, oh. man, I, I wish I was born like 50 years ago. Well, I, I, was, oh. guys, I was almost raised. I was like one second away from being raised in Hawaii. Oh. Over at Molokai. My parents took oh, me over go, there. I, I, was, I wasn't even a year old yet. And my own father, who had been uh, estranged from his father in Hawaii, brings me over, right? And my grandfather holds me in his arms. And he looks at me. And he looks at my dad and says, Kimo, let me raise him here the Hawaiian way, the traditional way. And my dad goes, absolutely. He goes to talk to my mom, and my mom goes, absolutely not. <laughs> Crazy. And so I was, I was instead raised in Oregon. See, God determined the times and the places. God set it all up. But the Bible says right here, why did God do that? He did that so perhaps it's on us. God puts the box, he puts all the characters, he puts, he goes, ready, action. He's the ultimate director. He's the ultimate, but he's not going to force you to worship him. That's not love. Love is giving the decision for someone to, to choose love. That's what love is. And what do we find here? God sets it all up so that we can seek God. You see, everyone is seeking God. They just don't know it. They just haven't found the true unknown God of their life today. Preach. You see, if I wasn't raised in Oregon, then back in 2007, I would have never been driving in the car. My, 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 my girlfriend at the time in her car, we're in a fight. We pull off the, the freeway because her her uh, radiator overheats. It's freezing cold out. I'm trying to figure out how to fix this, this car. And this car of young adults drives by and I try to wave them down like, hey, 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 we need help. And the guy in the back just waves. And I'm like, dude, that's so schmucky. But back then I, I probably said other words other than schmucky, you know what I'm saying? And so they turn around and they come and right. And so, so here's what happens. They help us with the car and then they happen to be disciples, right? So they go, hey, man, we invite you to church. So I go, oh, oh yeah, absolutely. I love God. I'm totally a Christian. I, you know, I love God and 
Um, it's really ah. awesome. And praise the Lord, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all totally, man. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Come on, bro. You know it. Did. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. We live together and we're not, oh, well, yeah. Well, we're, we're totally living a simple life. Yeah. But praise the Lord, brother. Yeah. Let's do it. Right. And so these guys totally reach out. Totally love God. And, and God set it up. Now I can become a true disciple. I could find the unknown God. But I didn't want to know the unknown God. I had too much of the unknown of the world that I still wanted. And my life got darker and darker and darker and darker. So then I had this like really genius idea. Maybe some of you have either done that or you, maybe you, you're, you're, hopping, you're hopping on this idea right now. My idea was this. I was still going to party. I was still going to be immoral. I was still going to do drugs. I was still going to get drunk. I was still going to look at pornography. I was still going to live this way. But I grew up religious, so I knew I needed to go to church on Sunday. So I prayed. I said, God, you know, I've been really good. Help me find a church that I can go to, that I just know it's going to be where you want me to be. I prayed. I was seeking God with all my heart. And so I walk into my class that Monday morning. There was only seven people in the class. It was learning how to speak Swahili for East Africa. Yay! Okay, I was taking this class. It's my freshman year. I was taking this class. I was pretty smart in a bad way. I, I was a history major. I found out that you could actually get your, your Bachelor of Arts without having to take any math classes if you did history and took two years of a foreign language. I said, bro, sign me up. So I didn't want to do Spanish because I, you know, I already did that. I didn't want to do like, you know, French or, you know, Italian. Then I saw Swahili. I was like, what is that? And then I found out that the, the person teaching Swahili, it was their first year as a professor. And I went, oh, dude, easy A. This guy is going to like it. Everybody in A. So I go to it. So I walk into class and lo and behold, this, this gal walks in and we all kind of knew each other and stuff. And she's like super happy. And I go, what are you so happy about? And she goes, oh, I got baptized. I said, baptized, happy. Where do you go to church? And she invites me out to church. So, so she tells me the name of the church. Afterwards, I, we had, you know, like the computer lab right there. So I go on to Yahoo. That was the search engine at the time. And I type in the name of the church and I press enter to see what they believe. And kind of, what's, and it's like cult, brainwash, manipulate. All, like, oh, I'm like, oh my goodness. This is not yeah. good. And, uh, but I was perplexed because this girl had straight A's. This girl was a journalist major. She, she was interviewing people like Hillary Rodham Clinton. She was interviewing, she had internships down at ABC. She was like super opinionated. And I was like, ain't nobody gonna tell that girl what to do. Like, let, let, let's, let, let me find out for myself. I, I don't want, I don't want to, I, I want to do any more heavy lifting to find church. If this one's good, I'll just go there. Who cares? So I go to, to a Bible discussion, Bible talk. And when I show up, I went to the wrong part of the building. It was a bunch of Korean people playing chess. And I was like, is this Bible talk? Are we with this? And they're like, oh, check me. You know, like, okay, wrong place. So I, I messaged her. I said, hey, I think I went to the wrong place, all this stuff. She goes, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't have my phone on me. Hey, we've got this campus event tomorrow night. We're going to help a married couple who are in the hospital right now because they're about to have their fifth child. They just bought a house. We're going to tear out the wallpaper and we're going to like, we're totally going to like help renovate their house. I was like, oh my gosh, bro, this is the best thing ever. Like, I'm going to go pray Jesus into my heart again and serve people. Bro, if I do this, I'm good for like the next two months. Yeah, oh, yo, bro. That's too much, yo. bro. I get my Bible. I got my. I play guitar in the worship band, so I got my guitar. I even got my little djembe. I play, you know, drums. I was like, man, we can get real worship. We can get in the spirit real good on this one, baby. And I show up, right? And I walk into the house, and the first three people I see are the same three dudes that months ago had helped me when my car broke down. Whoa. Wow. Whoa. <laughs> oh my God. And I was like, what? Dun, dun, dun. What, why, why did this happen? Because God was super gracious. It didn't take just one time. 
God was gracious. It took a second time for me to humble out. And when we got in the scriptures, I was like, bro, that was in February of 2007. And on April 4th, 2007, I was baptized. Come on, Come on bro. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Yes. You see, for us, everyone is seeking God. They just don't know who the unknown God is. I got to put a challenge on us as the campus ministry. You know, we kind of heard of this and that. How many of us are actually devoted to getting into our own Bible studies right now? I want to challenge us to be a seeker of seekers. People are seeking God, but they're not going to find God unless their God uses you to set them up. A lot of times people go, well, what about that guy in the middle of the rainforest? Well, what about that person that lives in the middle of Africa? Well, what if you're the one that's supposed to go and get them? Oh, come on, man. Tyler. Come on, Tyler. Nice, bro. And I think a lot of us right now, like, if we're honest, if we were like to, 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 to open up the, the gallery view and we just all got super humble and we put up on our hand, the number of Bible studies that we are personally leading right now. A lot of people would be like this, like this, right? We'd be like, like this. And I'm not talking about like Dave, who you've set up seeking God with 14 times now that like, we don't even know if he's actually a real person, you know, oh, like, oh. I want us, Dave. like, let's fight to be like this. Just imagine. Ooh. We're talking one, two, three, four, five times one, two, three, 25. Then we've got over here another 25. We've got 80 people. Imagine if 80 plus people all just committed to themselves, five people that they're going to reach out to, five people that they're going to study with personally. You know what that would be? That'd be over 400 Bible studies. You know what would happen? If our dear brother, Jason Dimitri, opened up to see where the Bible studies were at in the church, the number of studies, and he saw like 450 Bible studies, that guy would be fired up. We owe it to God. We owe it to God that all of us tonight makes a commitment to be a seeker of seekers. That we all come on the tenacity. To, to go out every day and share with 15, 20, 30, 50, however many people until you get five Bible go home. studies. Yes, sir. Come on, Tyler. Yes, sir. People are so burnt right now. People are hurting so bad right now. They're looking for truth. They're dudes like me that are religious, that are living a double life with their girlfriend. They're dudes like whoever it is that are thinking about killing themselves. They're thinking about giving it all up. They're dudes that are, don't know what to believe. They're people that have never heard of Christianity and they just know that there's gotta be something more. There's so many religious people that are seeking after God. You know, this is, the year of mountain moving faith. I believe with all my heart, we've got a whole crew of mountain movers right here. So I'm fired up. We got to go up to, uh, you know, to Mauna Kea. Mauna Kea is the biggest mountain in the world. And I took out a little piece of rock from it. Oh, oh, you, oh you took a rock. Bro, well, who knows just... what's up with that? He knows it's not a good thing to do right there. going to get man. haunted by the shadow walkers. Super not good. Bro, I believe in God. Amen. But I said, I'm going to move the biggest mountain in the world. And then I did. I got to take and go, we're going to move the biggest mountains. Guys, we're going to move the biggest mountains, the biggest ministries. That our campus ministries are not just going to be fledgling around 5 or 10 or 15. That we're going to be those that we get to 50 just in our campus ministries. We get to 100 in our campus ministries that we're getting so much heat, but there's nothing they can do because our people got our back and they look as if they must be doing something. No more should Mother God be bigger than us. No more should the Baptist ministry be bigger than us or the just, just feel as you are or the LGBTQ groups or, you know, the Black Lives Matters groups or the, hey, everybody should own a gun and we're Republican groups or whatever it is. We should be the biggest 
hottest, most go-getting group on these campuses. Come on. Whether they're Let's virtual go. or oh. in person. Let's move that mountain this year. Are you with me or church? Let's go, Tyler. Oh, Come on, bro. bro. Come on, Honestly, Tyler. Honestly, nothing has Come changed. Come on, real. Nothing has changed. The reason nothing has changed is because the world has been waiting for a generation that takes a stand for the truth and says enough is enough. Jesus' ragtag group went on and what did they do? They changed the world. The world has not been changed for 2,000 years. I believe that over at Cal State East Bay, we're going to get the change. San Francisco State, it's going to see change. UC Berkeley, Stanford, San Jose State, no! University of Let's go. Costa, Oakland, Santa Cruz, San Mateo, that Let's everywhere go is going to open change. Up. Why? Because we understand and fight for everyone to hear the truth. Let's Why do we hear the truth? Because simply everyone's religious. But what, in fact, are they seeking? They're seeking God. Let us be the generation that does it, that we change the cycle, we change the mold, and we watch God make it happen. I love you guys so much. Come on, bro. Come on, Tyler. Let's go.